Please turn in your copy of God's totally trustworthy and true word to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. If you're using one of the Bibles provided, you can find the passage beginning on page 985. 985. What's your role in Jesus' mission? What's your role in Jesus' mission? As a Christian, you know you're supposed to be doing something to make Jesus known to outsiders, but maybe you feel adrift and uncertain. Do you know what you should be doing to advance the good news that Jesus came to rescue sinners from eternal death and hell? Now, you, you might be thinking to yourself, I'm, I'm just an ordinary Christian, I'm, I'm no one special, That's fine, I'm still talking to you. I'm talking to you because you have a role in Jesus' mission. Jesus calls you to the ordinary work of prayer. Jesus calls you to the ordinary work of speaking about him when people ask you about your life. And Jesus does extraordinary things through ordinary people like you. It's what Jesus was doing through the ordinary church and somewhat unknown church in Colossae. In our passage, we see Paul, the Apostle Paul, call the Colossians into Jesus' mission of prayer and proclamation. Uh, Colossae was a city in the central and western portion of what's known today as Turkey. Uh, Paul wrote to the church because he learned about their faith in Christ and the challenges that they were facing. So far, in the letter, Paul has announced Jesus' authority over everything. Jesus is Lord because he's the author of everything. Jesus is the Lord of his people, the church, because he gave his life for them on the cross. That's what Paul said in chapter 1. And Paul urged the Colossians in chapter 2 to keep walking in Jesus. You see, some in Colossae were offering alternatives or additives to Jesus. But self-made religion can't save you or stop your sinful passions. But Paul proclaims Jesus because Jesus can save and Jesus can help struggling sinners. Paul urged the Colossians in chapter 3 to look up to Christ and by Jesus' power to put sin down into the grave. And Paul, he applied Jesus' all-encompassing lordship to the household of faith, the church. And Paul applied Jesus' all-encompassing lordship to individual households. That's what we learned most recently in this letter. And what we see in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, is Paul's desire for Jesus' lordship to reach the nations and for the Colossians to be involved in that mission. The good news of Jesus' lordship isn't to be contained in the Colossians' little church or their households. The good news of Jesus' lordship is to grow as Paul goes on his mission of preaching and proclaiming and as the Colossians go about their lives in living for Jesus. That's why Paul asks the Colossians to pray that he would proclaim Christ clearly. And Paul urges the Colossians to walk wisely so they may proclaim Christ confidently. That's what Paul is saying in our passage. See if you agree. Follow along as I read Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Paul writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Paul's message is this. Pray for me to proclaim Christ clearly. That's what he says in verses 2 to 4. And live or walk so you may proclaim Christ confidently. That's what he says in verses 5 to 6. You see, this passage, it invites you into the mission of Jesus and making him known. It invites you into the mission of making Jesus known by praying for clear proclamation of Christ and by living to confidently proclaim Christ when you're asked about your life. So, beloved, here's the sermon in a sentence. Pray for Christ to be proclaimed clearly and live to proclaim Christ confidently. 
Pray for Christ to be proclaimed clearly and live to proclaim Christ confidently. These are two roles that you take up in Jesus' mission. And these two ideas, they're going to form the outline of the rest of the sermon. Let's begin with our first point. Pray for Christ to be proclaimed clearly. Read verses 2 to 4 again of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Paul first urges the Colossians to pray, and then to pray for him. The Colossians are to continue steadfastly in prayer. They're to devote themselves to praying, to persist in prayer. And Paul, he has modeled this for the Colossians in his own spiritual life. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, if you were to look over there, you'd see that Paul said that since he'd heard about their faith, he'd not stopped praying for them. Paul hasn't stopped praying, and the Colossians shouldn't stop praying either. In fact, this is exactly what the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem did in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. When they were waiting in the upper room, we read, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, why do you think Paul calls the Colossians to persevere in prayer, to be devoted to prayer, to continue steadfastly in prayer? Because it's what Christians should do? Well, yes, but it's also because Christians sometimes give up a little too easily. It's easy to grow weary in pursuing God in prayer. What do you do if you've given up in prayer? Is that you? Well, brother or sister, let me encourage you to start again. That's what you do if you've given up in prayer. Pick it up again and go to the Lord and share your heart with Him. Beloved, recognize the privilege of prayer. In prayer, you talk to God, the one who made everything. You talk to the all-knowing, almighty God. In prayer, you talk to the righteous, holy, just, good, and loving God. In prayer, you praise God for his goodness. As we heard from our brother Chip last Sunday night, in prayer, you honor God's name as holy. In prayer, you depend upon God's power and providence. And in prayer, you remember that God is your loving Father. Prayer really is a privilege. So continue steadfastly in it. Paul tells the Colossians, you see there, to persevere in prayer and be watchful in it. Some translations put it like this. Keep alert or stay alert. This phrase, being watchful, can also mean to stay awake. Now, Paul, he's not chastising you for falling asleep during prayer. He's teaching you something much deeper in this phrase, being watchful. You see, when Jesus taught his disciples about his return... He urged them to be watchful. So in Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 36, no less than three times did Jesus tell his disciples, keep awake or stay awake. In the New Testament, this idea of being watchful is connected to Jesus' return. So Jesus' parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, when he's teaching about his return, it concludes like this. This parable concludes like this. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. In other words, you don't know when the bridegroom is coming back, when Jesus will come back. So keep watch. Stay awake. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul links Jesus' return to staying awake, saying, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Paul's teaching us that we're living in a particular era of redemptive history. That you're living on the edge of Jesus' return. So don't give up. Jesus is coming soon. Keep praying. Keep praying, he says, you see there, with thanksgiving. Why with thanksgiving? Well, because you've been rescued. In Colossians 1.12, Paul told the Colossians to give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Your sins disqualified you. You were undeserving, but God, in the riches of his grace, sent his son to rescue you from eternal death and hell. Pray with thanks because you have better than you deserve, Christian. You're you're going to receive a glorious eternal inheritance in heaven. Why pray with thanksgiving? 
because the time is short and Jesus is returning. Beloved, he came to rescue you once and he'll come to rescue you a final time. Don't lose heart. Pray with eager expectation of his return. Christian, Jesus' commitment to come and get you and bring you to himself, as he says in John 14, should fill your heart with thanks. Jesus won't leave you behind. And there's a reason that Paul call, ties this call to prayer to his commission, really, in verses 3 and 4. It's because prayer propels proclamation. Beloved, prayer propels proclamation. The time is short, but that doesn't mean we can sit still. There's work for us to do, and part of it is to pray. There's the work of carrying out Jesus' commission, and we should be praying for it, because Jesus must be proclaimed. So, Paul says, look, while you're devoting yourself to prayer, pray also for us. Here's the faithful and bold Apostle Paul asking for prayer. Everyone needs prayer. If Paul needs prayer, then you need prayer. And I need prayer. And if Paul asked for prayer, then you should ask for prayer too. When someone asks you how they can pray for you, give them a specific answer. Give them something to pray about. Paul, he gives specifics, doesn't he? You see what he says? He wants the Colossians to pray for there. The first thing out of Paul's mouth is that he wants God to open a door for the word. Do you pray for gospel opportunities? Do you pray for God to open doors for you? Well, who opens the door? Who does Paul say opens the door? Who makes gospel opportunities possible? Who advances Jesus' lordship among the nations? God does. God opens the door. This same kind of door opening language, it turns up in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, and 2 Corinthians 2, 12. And it all refers to the same thing. God makes gospel opportunities possible. God advances Jesus' lordship among the nations of the earth. God, in his sovereign wisdom and power, orchestrates and ordains the advance of his word. And so we need to ask him to open doors. And don't lose sight of this. God does it through answering the prayers of local churches like ours and faithful Christians like you. Do you see how you're to be involved in Jesus' mission here? God uses means, and he means to use your prayers to advance the good news of Jesus. That's why we prayed for the advance of the gospel in Iraq during the pastoral prayer this morning. It's why we always pray for some particular nation in that pastoral prayer. God advances his gospel through answering our prayers. It's why we prayed for our supported ministries and missionaries this past Sunday night during our monthly evening prayer service. And this means that throughout the month, brother or sister, let me encourage you to pray for our supported ministries and missionaries. So pray for Mark and Megan. Pray for Christopher and Iris. Pray for Tiago and Marta. Pray that the Lord would open doors among uh, Chinese and Portuguese-speaking peoples. Pray for John and Clara in the Middle East. So Paul wants the Colossians to pray for God to open a door for the word. In Colossians 1.5, Paul mentions this word. There Paul said that it's the word of truth, the gospel. This word is none other than the mystery of Christ. So in Colossians 1.27, Paul said, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Jesus came to rescue sinners, to reside within them, and Jesus will return to bring them to glory. That's the message that Paul wants to proclaim, and it's the message that every preacher should proclaim. Friend, if you're here this morning, you're not a believer or follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you know this message about Jesus. Friend, do you know that you need to be rescued by Jesus? You and I and everyone has sinned against God. We've decided to live our own way rather than God's way. We've rebelled against the infinite, holy, and eternal God. And our sins deserve an infinite, holy, and eternal punishment in hell. But in love, God the Father sent his one and only most beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ And Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to God the Father. Jesus never sinned. And yet, Jesus gave his life for sinners on the cross. He was the substitute for them, standing in their place, receiving the wrath of God that was due to their sins. Jesus 
took God's infinite, holy, righteous, eternal wrath upon himself so that we might be saved. And three days after his death, God the Father raised Jesus up from the dead, vindicating him and proving to us all that our sins have been paid for and that we might be forgiven through Jesus. And so now Jesus calls and he commands you to turn from your sins and to place your faith in him. Friend, Jesus calls you to believe that he lived for you, that he died for you, that he was raised from the grave for the forgiveness of your sins. Friend, turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus came to rescue you, to reside within you, to give you the hope of glory that you might live with him forever. And if you want to know more about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, friend, come and find me at the door after the service. Talk with a friend or family member that you came here with this morning. There's nothing more important that you can think about than this good news in Jesus Christ. Paul, he proclaimed the mystery of Christ, the gospel. And it's the message, as we can see in our passage, that landed him in prison. Do you see that at the end of verse 3? Why do you think Paul mentions his chains, his imprisonment? It's, it's actually the first time he mentions his imprisonment in this letter. It's almost kind of an aside, isn't it? Why mention it? Well, because Paul wants the Colossians to pray for him. Paul, he's committed to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever he is, even in prison. In 2 Timothy 2.9, Paul said that he was bound with chains as a criminal, but that the word of God was not bound. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he said imprisonment actually served to advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the whole imperial guard. Philippians 1.13 Openly declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ might land you in prison, but that might just be God's way of advancing Jesus' lordship. That's what was happening with Paul. Either way, Paul says, pray for me. Pray for God to open a door, maybe his prison door, so that he can go and proclaim Christ. Uh, but maybe after that, beyond, in other places as well. He also says, Pray for God to open my mouth about the Messiah. Pray that I make an open declaration. Do you see that in verse 4? Paul asked the Colossians to pray that he makes Christ clear. Jesus isn't to be hidden in Christian preaching and proclamation. Jesus is to be held up and held out to sinners as the saving Lord. But when sinners have some power over you, like if you're in prison... There's the temptation to hide Jesus' lordship. Have you ever kept your mouth closed in fear of those? Maybe an authority over you. In fear, have you ever cut out the sharp edges of the gospel of Jesus? It's almost every Christian's temptation at some point. Beloved, pray for our missionaries. And pray for your preachers. Pray for me to make Christ clear. Pray for whoever steps into the pulpit wouldn't hide Christ or hold back the truth. Believe it or not, it can be a real temptation. But everyone who gathers here needs to hear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Do you know how God gets preachers over that fear? Do you know how God gets preachers through that temptation? In part through your prayers. So pray every week for those who serve in this pulpit. In fact, there's an obligation upon preachers, I think. Paul says, preaching Christ clearly, do you see there, is how he ought to speak. Paul must preach Christ clearly because Christ commissioned him to preach. But Christ must also be preached clearly, otherwise he won't be known. Do you see the necessity of clear, clear Christian preaching? So pray. Pray for yourself and pray for Christ to be proclaimed clearly. Let's turn now and consider our second point. Live to proclaim Christ confidently. Live to proclaim Christ confidently. Follow along as I read verses 5 and 6 again. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Three ideas jump out of these verses. Paul wants the Colossians to walk wisely, to speak graciously, and answer confidently. The first idea is right there in the first three words of verse 5. You see it, walk in wisdom. 
for Paul, the image of walking is the image of, of living, uh, going forward in life. Uh, Paul has used this image twice in Colossians. So in Colossians 1.10, Paul said to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Then in Colossians 2.6, a key verse in this letter, Paul said, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Uh, the idea of walking communicates movement, doesn't it? You're moving forward. So, so in this imagery, Paul's saying that as you move forward in this life, seek to honor and please the Lord Jesus. And in our passage, verses, uh, verse 5 of chapter 4, Paul's saying, as you move forward in life, be wise about your interactions with outsiders. Show them Christ. For the, the wisdom that Paul has in mind is found in Christ. After all, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, as Paul says in Colossians 2.3. To use the teaching of, of chapter 3 of Colossians, to walk in Jesus' wisdom is to set your mind on things above. To remember what is ultimate, Colossians 3, 1 to 4. To walk in Jesus' wisdom is to put sin to death and live according to Jesus' righteousness, Colossians uh, 3, 5 to about verse 17. Uh, to walk in Jesus' wisdom is to serve the Lord Jesus in your relationships and responsibilities. We saw that uh, in chapter 3, verse 18, through chapter 4, verse 1, to exemplify submission and love, to render obedience and to extend compassion, to joyfully work and to extend just rewards. Walk in the wisdom of Christ because your life in all of those relationships and responsibilities is to be a living picture of Christ. And that's because you, Christian, are an ambassador for Christ. Earthly ambassadors, they don't represent themselves. They represent their home country and leader of their home country. Christians belong to earthly kingdoms or nations. And Christian, you should be a good citizen. You should be productive and peaceful. Still, your primary allegiance is to the kingdom of Christ. As Paul says in Philippians 3.20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As an ambassador for Christ... You're called to live in a way that testifies to the glory, the righteousness, and joy of the heavenly king and his kingdom. Paul says we're to walk in wisdom toward outsiders in verse 5. Who are these outsiders? Well, they're those who aren't believers in Jesus or members of his kingdom. As Paul was walking through those household codes, it might be your parents that you're trying to honor, your master that you're trying to serve. It could be your spouse that you're trying to relate to. These believers in Jesus, as they go about their lives, they're potentially interacting with outsiders, maybe even within their own household, or certainly within their community. Why walk in wisdom toward them? Because they're outside of Jesus' kingdom and need to be brought into Jesus' kingdom. That's partly how you're involved in Jesus' mission. So wherever you are, within your household, within your neighborhood, within your workplace, on your team or in your school, Consider that there are outsiders around you who need to be brought in. And you should be wise about how you can show Christ to them. Paul knows that you have an ongoing testimony to outsiders. Whether you think about it or not, your life's saying something about Jesus. Your witness occurs in part through a life according to the wisdom of Christ, the principles of God's word and the wisdom he gives us in his word. And you can only know the wisdom of Christ through knowing Christ himself. So consciously or unconsciously, outsiders, they, they see the way you act. They observe the choices you make. They scrutinize your habits. They watch your behavior. So let them see you walk in Christ's likeness. Paul's saying this because just as he would have been tempted to close his mouth in prison, so you will be tempted to walk in the world's path while living here on earth. Uh, John Woodhouse, a commentator, was right when he wrote, in your dealings with outsiders, there will always be pressure to conform, fit in, win approval, and be well thought of. You know this in your daily lives, don't you? Whether it's at work, maybe you've got to use the right language, maybe it's at a social event or school or your sports team, there will always be pressure to do and say what the world wants. Walking in wisdom means doing what promotes Christ over and above your reputation. Walking in wisdom means doing what promotes Christ over and above what protects your comfort in the world. With his imprisonment, Paul's a living example, isn't he? When Paul had the choice to protect his comfort or proclaim Christ, 
He chose to proclaim Christ. Paul proclaimed Christ in word and deed. Paul walked wisely, and he's calling the Colossians and you into this life of wisdom. The Lord is watching, and outsiders are watching. So for the honor of Jesus and in fear of the Lord, live as Jesus calls you to live. Walk in wisdom. Let them see you. Let outsiders see you walk in Jesus' wisdom. Indeed, this life of wisdom means knowing what time it is and knowing how much time is left. Uh, Paul, he's already indicated that you're to be watchful. You're living on the edge of Christ's return. The clock is running out. And given that the time is so short, make the most of every opportunity. Because, beloved, when the Lord opens a door to show and share Christ, you should walk through it every time. The phrase, make the best use of time, carries with it the idea of like purchasing time. So Paul's essentially saying, buy time. There's not much left, and there's so much to do. In Ephesians 5.16, Paul uses a similar phrase. There he says that we're to make the best use of time because the days are evil. Because the world is so dark. Because so many are lost. And because Jesus is so near to coming back, you need to make the most of every opportunity to use your time with outsiders wisely. So don't miss the opportunity to show them Christ. Don't pass it up. Don't miss the opportunity to speak of Christ. Living with Christ-like integrity gives you the courage to speak of Christ with integrity. Do you see the word always there in verse 6? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you ought to answer each person. That always is painful, isn't it? Gracious words haven't always filled our mouths. There's a reason that Paul told us in Colossians 3.8 to put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from our mouths. And why in Ephesians 4.29, Paul said, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Yes, a Christian's speech must have a gracious tone. Uh, you must speak with kindness and love. But Paul especially has in mind when the door is open, when the opportunity knocks, when someone asks you about Christ, you're always to speak about God's grace in Christ. Think about it. In verse 3, Paul requested prayer that God would open a door for him to speak of Christ. And now he turns to the Colossians and says, you should speak about Christ too. That's what the whole of verse 6 is about. It speaking of God's grace in Christ. Seasoning your speech with the Savior and answering an outsider when he asks you about your life. Even when Paul says that your speech should be seasoned with salt, he's thinking about the Savior. Jesus, he had his own teaching about salt. So in Matthew 5.13, Jesus said to his disciples, You disciples are the salt of the earth. Now, I love salt uh, probably too much. It, it brings out flavor. It's wonderful. So in order for disciples to be the salt of the earth, you must live a life that brings out the flavor of the kingdom of heaven. Paul, he's more directly talking about your speech here, though. So yes, you're to be salt in your life, but your speech is to be seasoned with salt. Uh, these days, when people mention salty speech, right, they, they have in mind kind of crude and coarse language. But it's not what Paul means by salty speech. Paul means that your speech must give outsiders a taste for the king and his kingdom. To give them an understanding of God's grace in Christ. Paul even tells you why you should walk wisely and speak graciously. Because this is all headed somewhere. Can you, can you find the purpose clause there in verse 6? Set your eyes on that purpose clause. Why should you walk wisely and speak graciously? So that, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Paul's saying that these gospel opportunities are going to come to you. A life of walking wisely and speaking graciously over time builds a base of knowledge in Jesus Christ and for outsiders to raise questions about Christ. Walk wisely and speak graciously so that you can answer confidently for Christ. When your life's rooted and built up in Christ, then you have an answer for outsiders. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. He wrote, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. 
Now, in Peter's context, he was speaking to suffering Christians. He was telling them, in the midst of your suffering, lift up Christ in your heart. When you're enduring this pain, recognize Jesus as Lord. If Jesus is lifted up as Lord in your heart, then you're prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you. When persecutors see your suffering like Christ, they're going to start asking questions. And if Christ is Lord in your heart, you'll be prepared to give them an answer. This is what prepares you. Jesus being lifted up in your heart, being honored and revered. And isn't, that, isn't Paul saying that too here in our, our text? Walking in Christ and speaking of Christ, making Christ your daily practice and pattern in word and deed, gives you confidence to answer anyone who asks about Christ. And notice your obligation. Did you see that we have an ought in this passage? You need to know how you ought to speak. You remember when Paul used this language in verse 4? When Paul said he ought to speak clearly, well, you ought to know how you're to answer. It's one of the reasons that actually when we have people join this church, we sit down with them for what we call a membership interview. And that sounds way too intense for what it actually is. We want to hear their testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also want to hear them share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that members coming into our church family know how they ought to answer. When somebody says, so what's the truth about Jesus? We want you to be able to answer and to be prepared. So when you became a disciple of Jesus, you became one who was called to go and make more disciples of Jesus. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew 28, 19. That's part of your role in Jesus' mission. So when asked, you ought to speak of Jesus. Jesus is the answer for why you live wisely and speak graciously. When a, a co-worker, a neighbor, a classmate, or a teammate asks, why did you do this or that? Or, or, or why didn't you do this or that? View the question as an opportunity, an open door to speak of Jesus. Why didn't you gloss over the difference in the quarterly financial report? Uh, why didn't you use ChatGPT to write your essay? Why didn't you clap back when somebody insulted you? The answer is not merely because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do because Jesus is Lord. And he calls you to honesty, integrity, and kindness. The answer is Jesus has saved me and is changing me. Can I tell you about him? Beloved, whatever the situation may be, if by the grace of God you walk wisely and speak graciously, outsiders may take notice and ask. And that's a mission moment for you from Jesus. It's an open door to walk through. And it's what I want us to think about as we conclude. I wonder, do you recognize the, the similarities and differences between Paul's mission and the Colossians' mission? Do you see Paul's role and the Colossians' role in Jesus' mission? While Paul is going on mission, he's making opportunities to proclaim Christ clearly. And, and there's a place for you to do that. Perhaps the Lord might call you to be a pastor and minister someday. Maybe he calls you to be a missionary and preacher of the Lord Jesus Christ. You then go and you make opportunities to make Christ known. So Paul, he's going to new towns and synagogues, finding and making opportunities to proclaim Christ. But the Colossians, Paul kind of talks about them as they're going about their lives. He talks about how opportunities to proclaim Christ confidently will actually find them. So by the grace of God, if you're living wisely and speaking graciously, you're going to have to respond to anyone who asks about Jesus. Your ordinary role in Jesus' mission doesn't mean you have to force a conversation about him. You don't have to pull a Jesus juke at the office, right? Jesus, a Jesus juke is um, when you awkwardly kind of shove Jesus into a conversation. So uh, a friend says to you, did you see the winning goal in the hockey game last night? Did you know that your response then, the Jesus juke is, did you know that Jesus is the goal of life? That's not what he was asking you about. But you, you should find a way to talk about Jesus. But you don't have to force that in. It's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's not saying awkwardly make mission opportunities. He's saying take the mission opportunities that come to you because you've walked wisely and, you've, and outsiders have asked. Yes, you, the ordinary Christian, that's your role in Jesus' mission. You are an evangelist and you're called to proclaim Christ clearly and you can be confident that you have an answer in him. Pray. Pray. For Christ to be proclaimed clearly and live to proclaim Christ confidently. Like Paul, when God opens the door 
through your walking wisely and speaking graciously, answer the call of Jesus' mission and make his saving power known. Let's pray for that now. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray and ask that you would help us to live faithful lives, that you would help us to live righteous, godly, and sober lives so that others around us may see a difference in our lives and the lives that people in the world live. And Father, we pray and ask that you would make us missionaries and evangelists even this coming week. Maybe even today we see a neighbor or a friend. Uh, Father, we pray throughout the, the, the regular week. Maybe we're at work or other locations we may be. Father, we pray and ask that you would help us to live with integrity. That you would help us to walk wisely. That you'd help us to speak graciously so that others ask us about Christ. Father, we want to be asked about Christ and we want to give the answer that Christ is our hope. Father, would you be pleased to make us servants of Christ? Give us opportunities to speak of Christ. To open a door for us, we pray and ask. Make our congregation one that sees many come to know Jesus Christ because you have opened the door. Father, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.